In Wisconsin, dismembered human remains are found along a river's edge. To solve this murder, investigators must first find a way to identify the victim. The body of a decomposed man is found in an Arizona state park. Only advanced computer technology can lead detectives to his killer. After finding skeletal remains, Texas police arrest a suspect in the murder. But unless the victim can be quickly identified, detectives will be forced to set a killer free. Some killers believe that by concealing the identity of their victims, their crimes will go unpunished. But with advanced technology, forensic artists are identifying faceless victims and exposing a killer's guilt by drawing conclusions. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Outside the city limits of Madison, the serene landscape of Sauk County, Wisconsin is a popular destination for people looking to enjoy the outdoors. Around 4 p.m. on July 30th, 1999, a woman and her son were hiking a trail along the shores of the Wisconsin River. The young boy noticed a plastic grocery bag at the water's edge. A closer look revealed the skeletal remains of a human hand. The mother quickly summoned police. Officers from the Sauk County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene. The hand was still attached to the arm, which had been precisely severed at the shoulder joint. Unsure what to make of the finding, police decided to spread out and search the area. Scattered along the shoreline, they discovered several trash bags. Inside were more human remains. Detectives recovered the head and torso of what appeared to be an African-American woman. Her face and scalp had been sliced from the skull. All of the unidentified remains were collected and sent on for a more detailed analysis. For Detective Joe Welch of the Sauk County Sheriff's Department, the measures taken by the killer to conceal the victim's identity were telling. The skin had been removed and placed in a separate garbage bag. It appeared that it was removed in a, a skillful fashion, that the person that was doing it knew what they were doing. To find the killer, investigators knew they would first have to identify the victim. By studying the remains, the medical examiner concluded that the woman was 5 feet 1 to 5 feet 3 inches tall and was likely between the ages of 18 and 25. The level of decomposition suggested she had been dead for at least five days. Examiners were able to obtain fingerprints from the victim's hands. Hoping the prints were on file, investigators ran them through the FBI's National Fingerprint Database. But there were no matches. Sauk County Sheriff Randy Stamen would have to find another way to give this victim a name. We initially thought that we'd be able to generate fingerprints and make a comparison and identify the body of the victim, feeling that if we could make that identification, we'd have a very good chance of solving the crime. When that failed, then the next step, obviously, was to put out a physical description and a photograph. The problem we had there was that we didn't have a face on our victim. 
flesh that remained on the victim's skull held the only clues to the woman's identity. And investigators knew that sending the severed head to a forensic artist for a facial reconstruction would destroy that evidence. But scientists at the Milwaukee School of Engineering believed they could help. They requested a CAT scan of the woman's head. Engineers believed that by using the CAT scan, they could possibly create an exact three-dimensional paper replica of the skull, which could then be used by a forensic artist to reconstruct the victim's likeness. And no evidence would be destroyed in the process. Engineering professor, Dr. Lisa Milkowski. In this case, we're trying to produce a replica that looks like and is very similar to an actual skull. And the paper layers look like, feel like an actual skull. First, engineers had to convert the data from the CAT scan into a computerized three-dimensional model. The resulting information was then transferred onto a disk. Next, the data was subjected to a process called rapid prototyping. Normally, rapid prototyping technology is used to test engineering designs that have been created on the computer. The process converts the computer model into an actual three-dimensional replica made of laminated paper, allowing engineers to analyze it for design flaws. The process had never been used in a forensic setting. First, the three-dimensional model of the skull was broken down into flat two-dimensional layers. Then, carbon dioxide lasers began precisely tracing each layer onto a sheet of paper. Each unique cutout is then layered on top of each other, fused together with glue. The layering process that is used when constructing an object with rapid prototyping is similar to thinking about slices in a loaf of bread. The entire loaf is three-dimensional in nature, but each slice is flat. The same thing is done when we construct an object with paper layers. We start out with, with a single paper layer, just like a sheet of paper, and the laser traces out the shape on that single layer. And as all these layers are stacked together, each one having a unique cutout, we come up with this uh, three-dimensional object. The resulting block of paper is whittled down until the replica is all that remains. Forty hours later, nearly 10,000 sheets of laminated paper had gone into creating an exact paper reproduction of the victim's skull. Investigators decided to send the replica several hundred miles away to the Kentucky State Crime Lab. There, Dr. Emily Craig, a renowned forensic anthropologist and a leader in facial reconstruction, was asked to put a face on the paper skull. The possibility of doing a clay reconstruction on a prototype skull was actually kind of exciting. To my knowledge, I don't think anyone in this country had done it for victim identification. To bring this victim to life, Dr. Craig attached tissue depth markers to several different points on the skull. These markers reflect the average thickness of skin for people of similar race, age, and sex. Before molding the facial features, however, Dr. Craig has to be certain that the eyes selected will be of the same size and shape as those of individuals similar to the victim. Guided by the spatial arrangements of the victim's skull, the eyes are precisely set into place. In order to generate recognition from the public, the spacing and the gaze of the eyes has to be perfect. Once completed, Dr. Craig began bringing Jane Doe to life by modeling her face using an oil-based clay. 
the fine detail as to the lids and the nose and the lips. That's basically where the artistic skills supersede or complement the scientific data. You really need both to do a good facial reconstruction. After dozens of hours, the face of the murder victim began to take shape. Variations of the victim's appearance were photographed and the clay model was sent to police in Sauk County. Investigators quickly released the photographs through the media. Still, weeks passed without a lead. But then, a woman named Sherry contacted police. She said the face in the poster bore an uncanny resemblance to a 25-year-old woman named Muvano Kupaza. Muvano, she said, had come to the United States from Tanzania to study English. What do you think? <laughs> Muvano was a relative of Sherry's ex-husband, Peter Kupaza, who was also from Tanzania. Though the three lived together for some time, Muvano began having problems at the couple's residence. Sherry learned that while the three were living together, Peter had become abusive towards his cousin. Late at night, while Sherry was asleep, he would sneak into Muvano's room. There, he raped the 25-year-old exchange student repeatedly, threatening to kill her if she ever told anyone. She told police that when Muvano told her what was going on, Sherry left her husband. A few weeks later, Muvano decided to return home. Police now believe that the young woman never made it back to Tanzania. Looking to verify that Muvano was the murder victim, detectives went door to door throughout the neighborhood. Neighbors agreed that the reconstructed face resembled Muvano Kupaza. Police questioned her 40-year-old cousin, Peter. He denied any knowledge of the murder. And he viewed photographs of the victim's reconstructed face with a total lack of recognition. I showed him a poster. I asked him if that looked like anyone he knew. He said it didn't look like anyone he knew at all. Though Peter claimed he had no pictures of his cousin, he agreed to turn over two photo albums. He added that he had recently spoken to Muvano's father in Tanzania. He was told that his cousin had made it home and was doing fine. Looking to verify the story, investigators contacted Muvano's family in Tanzania. According to her father, Muvano had never returned home and he hadn't heard from her in some time. Look really good. Uh, Peter Kupaza uh, had been caught in a lie. Detectives began digging into his background. Kupaza, they learned, had worked for several years as a butcher. Though that did not prove murder, it went a long way in explaining the precision in which the victim's remains had been severed. Believing the dismembered victim found at the Wisconsin River was Muvano Kupaza, investigators shifted their focus to building a murder case against her cousin, Peter. With the help of forensic anthropologist Dr. Emily Craig, investigators in Sauk County, Wisconsin, believed they had finally identified dismembered human remains as belonging to 25-year-old Tanzanian native Muvano Kupaza, And statements made by the young woman's relatives led police to believe that her cousin, 40-year-old Peter Kapaza, was behind the brutal murder and dismemberment. Before they could prove murder, however, police needed irrefutable proof that the victim found at the Wisconsin River was Muvano Kupaza. They tracked down her local doctor, 
Police collected the young woman's medical records, hopeful they contained the information needed to make a positive identification. They were in luck. We were able to get some forms that she had filled out and she had actually, she touched to, to fill these forms out. We took these forms to the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory where they did processing and actually were able to locate latent fingerprints on those forms and compared them to our deceased and found that uh, this was our deceased and she was identified as Movano Cupaza. To make their case against Peter, police contacted his ex-wife Sherry the following day. Though the suspect denied having any photos of Movano, Sherry discovered three pictures of her in her ex-husband's photo album. And they bore a striking similarity to Emily Craig's facial reconstruction. With a search warrant in hand, police and forensic technicians returned to Peter Kupaza's residence. Now they were looking to uncover physical proof of murder. In the bathroom, they believed they found it. On a section of the baseboard, they observed reddish-brown stains that appeared to be blood. The section was removed for future DNA testing. Investigators turned to forensic examiners for proof that Peter Kupaza had murdered his cousin. Examiners generated a genetic profile of the blood found in Kupaza's bathroom. When that was compared to the DNA recovered from the victim's flesh, they found an identical match. Peter Kupaza was arrested and charged with murder. Based on the evidence, investigators believe that Muvano began threatening to expose her cousin's sexual abuse. And Peter Kupaza would do anything to keep that from happening. After killing her, police believe he dragged the young woman's body into the bathroom, where he dismembered her. Then he tried to dispose of the remains by dumping them in the Wisconsin River. On June 22, 2000, Peter Kupaza was sentenced to life in prison for the first degree murder of his cousin, Wivano. In Wisconsin, the willingness to adapt a high-tech engineering process to crime solving led to the conviction of a brutal killer. To solve a murder in Phoenix, Arizona, police must rely on computer software to help them identify the victim. North of the city of Phoenix, on the evening of February 17, 1996, a hunter walking along a trail in the Tonto National Forest noticed something lying just inside the tree line. He approached the object, believing it to be an injured animal. But what he found was a lifeless human body. The man fled the scene and called 911. Deputies from the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office were dispatched to the scene. The victim, determined to be a white male, had suffered a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. But with no form of identification located, police were unable to determine who he was or why he had been murdered. And the level of decomposition had made it difficult to discern any identifiable facial features. The only clues to this victim's identity were a cowboy hat with a bullet hole just above the brim and a pair of prescription glasses. The following day, Maricopa County investigators were no closer to identifying the victim. But for Sergeant Keith Moore, mud stains found on the victim's clothes provided a clue as to when the murder had occurred. 
Well, earlier in that week, we had experienced rain in the area. There were some indications from the mud on the clothing that the, the body was there uh, before the rain because of the, the mud that was splashed up on the clothing on the pants legs. The medical examiner determined that the victim had been dead at least 10 days. Cause of death was a large caliber gunshot wound to the man's head, fired at close range. He was determined to be between the ages of 45 and 55, standing about six feet tall. But other than fingerprints, no identifying features remained. Decomposition had left his face unrecognizable. Until police could positively identify this victim, finding his killer would be nearly impossible. Police in Maricopa County, Arizona, continued trying to identify the decomposed body of a middle-aged white male who was found shot to death in the Tonto National Forest. Detectives began scouring recently filed missing persons reports, hoping to find one that matched their victim. But none were found. And the victim's fingerprints, which were recovered at autopsy, did not exist on any law enforcement database. Homicide detective Barry Lynch worked the case. Once we ran through our normal operating procedures, uh, investigating procedures, fingerprints, uh, the autopsy, uh, everything that we possibly could do, uh, we, we came to the conclusion that, that we had exhausted all our normal investigative uh, tools that we have at our disposal, and we were going to have to go someplace else and, and, and look into doing something different to try and make this case or try and identify this individual. Detectives turned to examiners at the nearby Glendale Police Department. There, forensic artist John Wintrow was assigned the case. By applying specially designed computer software to photographs of a victim's face, Wintrow has become an expert in erasing the effects of trauma and decomposition. Having a clear image of the victim's likeness makes it more likely that someone will recognize the face. In this case, it's a matter of using these tools to eliminate and clean up the original photograph, the original picture being scanned, to get rid of the decomposition, to get rid of the trauma, and take that image, which is once graphic, and turn it into a presentable image for the media so that it can assist in the identification of this person. Before beginning the reconstruction in this case, however, Wintrow had to first photograph the face of the victim found in the Tonto National Forest. When you're taking photographs of the victim's face, ideally, what you would like to have is what's referred to as a Frankfurt plane, which is just a, almost a portrait-like, eyes front, even uh, keeled facial shot. In doing so, in the process, you have to keep in consideration that you're going to be scanning this photograph in. Wintrow next photographed the cowboy hat and prescription glasses that were recovered from the crime scene careful to use the same scale as the photographs of the victim's face. Taking a Polaroid at arm's length away gives me a, a form of measurement so that when I'm taking photographs of glasses and cowboy hats and other items that are going to be scanned in on the photograph, I have a distance of measurement. Investigators hope that by layering such details onto the reconstructed face, it would become more likely that someone would recognize the victim. After scanning all of the photos into the computer, Wintrow was ready to begin the reconstruction. His first step was to use the computer software to eliminate the trauma and decomposition present on the victim's face. Taking those graphic images away starts off with finding a good piece of tissue, a good piece of, of, of skin that is not decomposed. And by taking uh, a tool referred to as clone pipe in this program, I can take this large circle which is placed over the tissue that is not decomposed or not uh, exhibiting trauma, and then taking the small uh, circle and cloning the good tissue over the bad tissue, or skin in this case. Then, using a smoothing tool, 
Wintrow blended all of the skin tones together until no traces of damaged tissue remained. In the final step of the process, the victim's prescription glasses and cowboy hat were layered onto the image. Finally, a week after the unidentified victim was found murdered, the forensic artist had given him a face. Maricopa County detectives quickly released the victim's image to the media. Within a few hours, John Wintrow's efforts paid off. A local resident, John Christian, recognized the victim as being 52-year-old Thomas Donahue. He hadn't seen or heard from Tom in some time. He described his friend as a simple but nice man who was always eager to gain the acceptance of people around him. John Christian told police that Tom, who was employed as a security guard for a local company, lived with a woman named Darlene Schlicht. Though Darlene and her friends were rumored to be involved in criminal activity, including forgery and check fraud scams, Tom tried to fit in with the group. Christian had heard that one of those friends, Carrie Scott, seemed to resent Tom's efforts to include himself in their activities. I think it's 23rd. Christian hadn't seen Darlene or any of her friends in some time. Her, her Aunt Sue works at... yes. Looking to prove that the victim was in fact Thomas Donahue, detectives contacted his employer. Some information about the case? Tom, they said, had not shown up for work in several weeks. Donahue's fingerprints were on file, and his employers agreed to forward them to the crime lab. Examiners compared the known prints of Thomas Donahue to those recovered from the victim. They matched. Thomas Donahue was officially the victim of a homicide. Now, looking to identify his killer, Investigators began tracking down his roommate, Darlene Schlick, for information. But she was nowhere to be found. A records check soon explained why. Three days after Thomas Donahue's body was found, Darlene Schlick had been arrested on forgery charges in nearby Tempe, Arizona. According to the reports, Darlene had tried to pass a check at a cafe using an account that had been closed for several months. It turns out the account was in the name of Thomas Donahue. After being turned over to police, Darlene was placed under arrest and transported to the Tempe jail. Though the finding was incriminating, it didn't prove that Darlene had committed murder. Police hoped that Carrie Scott, Darlene's alleged accomplice in the forgery scams, would have information about the homicide. But she was difficult to track down. A short while later, investigators got a tip that Carrie Scott was staying at a nearby motel. The woman who answered the door told police that Carrie wasn't there. But they didn't believe her. Police began searching the room. In the bathroom, they found Carrie hiding in the shower. She was placed under arrest on unrelated outstanding warrants. At the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, investigators questioned Carrie about Darlene's role in the murder of Thomas Donahue. At first, she was uncooperative. But after some time, Carrie decided to talk. She admitted to being present at the time of the killing, and she confirmed that Darlene Schlicht had committed the murder. 
According to Carrie, one night a few weeks back, she, Darlene, and another friend went out for a drive to the Tonto National Forest with Tom. As they made their way to a hiking trail, Darlene grabbed a handgun that Tom had brought along, ran up behind him, and shot him in the back of the head. Though Carrie Scott claimed she had no idea that Darlene was planning to kill Tom, the murder didn't surprise her. Darlene had recently told her that Tom knew too much about their forgery scams and she wanted to do away with him. After hearing the version of the incident from Carrie Scott then, uh, we had to find other individuals and other suspects that were involved in the case to be able to confirm or deny her version of the story. Police tracked down the third woman said to be present when the murder occurred. At first, Erica Land denied any knowledge of the killing. But when she learned Carrie Scott had told police she was there, Erica broke down. But she had a different story to tell. According to Erica, it was Carrie Scott and not Darlene Schlicht who had pulled the trigger. Erica said she had not been included in the planning of the murder. In exchange for her testimony, investigators agreed not to arrest her. Unsure what to make of the conflicting stories, detectives traveled to the Tempe jail to interview Darlene Schlicht. Like Erica Land, Darlene blamed the murder on Carrie Scott. Darlene admitted that she had helped plan the murder. They decided that Mr. Donahue wants to involve himself in our criminal activity, and out of a conversation that they had at Darlene's apartment, they conspired to go ahead and take him to some remote area in the county and kill Mr. Donahue. Didn't they tell you? Though police had no physical evidence to corroborate the testimony, they were now convinced that Carrie Scott's version of events was a lie. Carrie Scott uh, spent a good deal of her time trying to figure ways to isolate herself or remove herself from her involvement in this particular case. Uh, so there was a, a stark contrast between the two. And having interviewed the other principals involved in the case uh, and some of the other witnesses, uh, they all tend to corroborate what Ms. Slitz had, Darlene Slitz had stated. Police believe that Thomas Donahue tried to get involved in the group's criminal activity. But Carrie Scott and Darlene Schlicht didn't trust him, and they decided to kill him. On February 7, 1996, they lured him to an isolated spot at the Tonto National Forest. As he walked along a trail, Carrie Scott approached him from behind and shot him once in the head. They believed that prolonged exposure to the elements would keep his identity and their crime a mystery. Carrie Scott stood trial for the first degree murder of Thomas Donahue. She was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Darlene Schlicht was also tried and sentenced to life in prison. The composite that uh, Mr. Wintrow provided to us was uh, crucial in this case because it was the means by which someone was able to identify Mr. Donahue. Without that, we would have probably never found the identity of Mr. Donahue or the principal players involved in this case. With the aid of computer software, forensic artist John Wintrow was able to restore a victim's appearance and help bring two killers to justice. In Texas, police must rely on a renowned forensic artist to identify a faceless victim. In the late afternoon hours of July 18, 1989, a young boy playing near a lake in Wills Point, Texas, stumbled upon some debris that had washed ashore. Curious as to what he had found, he began poking at the trash. When it flipped over, he saw that it was a human skull wrapped in cloth. 
Frightened, the boy ran to tell his father. After receiving the 911 call, deputies from the Van Zant County Sheriff's Office were dispatched to Willow Lake. There, they located the human skull and a pair of blue denim shorts scattered on the ground. Rope had been used to bind the items. Police carefully collected the remains and a few stray red hairs lying nearby. Having found no other clues to the victim's identity, investigators forwarded what little evidence they had recovered to forensic examiners. From the level of decay, examiners determined that the remains had been lying outdoors for at least a year. And evidence of blunt force trauma found on the skull suggested the victim had been murdered. Further analysis led to the conclusion that the victim was a Caucasian female, but little else was learned. Captain Rock Ellis of the Van Zant County Sheriff's Office was contacted with the autopsy results. It was clear this would be a difficult case to solve. Forensics is telling me, you know, that the lady is uh, somewhere between uh, 20 and 40 years old. Uh, she had red hair. Um, and that's about all we had to go on at that time. As investigators struggled to identify the victim, dispatchers received a 911 call. More human remains had been found. Because of the decreased water level at Willow Lake, a passerby had stumbled upon a partial skeleton lying in the mud. It was found less than 200 feet away from where the skull had been found. Chicken wire surrounded the remains. The caging had been tied to concrete blocks with electrical wire and rope, likely used to keep the remains submerged in the lake. And there was something else. It appeared the ropes had been tied with the same type of knots as those found with the skull. Forensic analysis later confirmed that these remains were at one time attached to the skull found a week earlier. Though the findings had provided investigators with additional evidence of murder, the identity of this victim and her killer remain a mystery. Police in Van Zant County, Texas, struggled to identify female skeletal remains found scattered along the shores of Willow Lake. As police began canvassing the nearby neighborhood, they made a startling discovery in one of the yards. Lying next to a roll of chicken wire, police noticed some ropes. They were the same type and tied with the same knots as those found with the skeletal remains. The same knots were tied on all three places. A clove hitch is not unique, a bowline is not unique, but when you see those knots tied with the same type material in three different places, it focuses in on the same person tying the knots. Though no one was home, police obtained a warrant and collected the evidence. Now they needed to find out who lived at that residence. A property search revealed that the house belonged to an elderly couple who lived there with their 38-year-old son, Ronald Mark Holloway. And a records check indicated that Holloway was currently on parole for the sexual assault and attempted murder of a woman in another state. I contacted the officer that worked the case and uh, during our conversations, he gave me a lot of insight into Holloway. And he also read me part of a statement that Holloway made in which he said that if he did this again, he would uh, cut the person up and put him in the water. 
Though investigators had few clues to the identity of the woman found at the lake, they believed they had a suspect in her murder. What's this all about? Less than two months later, the elusive suspect, Ronald Holloway, was finally located in a nearby county and brought in for questioning. He admitted that he had tied the knots on the rope found at his parents' home. But he denied any knowledge of the murder. Detectives sensed that he was lying. Though their case was circumstantial, they decided to place Ronald Holloway under arrest for suspicion of murder. I was afraid that if I didn't make my move then, that uh, he would be a long time before I saw him again. So I figured I'd get him while I could. But with Holloway's arrest, investigators found a new challenge. Because of a Texas law, they had only a short period of time in which to formally charge the suspect with murder. Sergeant Steve Black of the Texas Rangers was asked to assist in the investigation. In Texas at that time, we had what they call a speedy trial act. And if you, if, if you didn't bring your defendant uh, to trial within that time, well, you, you know, you were in, in, in serious trouble. The defendant would be gone. Having only 60 days to make their case, investigators turned to renowned forensic artist Karen Taylor for help. With only a skull to work with, Taylor combined science and art in order to accurately reconstruct the features and fine details that make each face unique. The advantage in putting a face on a skull is that arrangement is given there in the skull. The openings exist already. The various orifices of the skull are there and the features have to be placed over them and so the proportions are built in. It's the spatial arrangement of those features that has proven in study after study to be critical for triggering recognition. Taylor begins by photographing the skull with 21 tissue depth markers placed at precise points. Tracing paper is then laid over the life-size photographs of the skull. Using the rubber markers as her guide, Taylor began shaping the contours of this victim's face. Once complete, the next step is to draw in the eyes, nose, mouth, and other features that will potentially lead to the identity of the victim. There are certain ways to calculate the individual features. There's a formula for each feature, for the development of the eye and determination of the width of the nose or the projection of the nose or the, the width of the mouth and so forth. Using established scientific data to approximate the size and shape of the victim's features, Taylor next looked to other evidence recovered from the crime scene to help her fine tune her drawing. A pair of blue jean shorts were recovered that were size 26 inch waist, indicating a really uh, slender individual. So I knew that I needed to slenderize the face somewhat, so I actually uh, shaded in the cheek area to make uh, the finished reconstruction drawing look more slender. Karen Taylor had taken a faceless skull and created the image of a young woman, hopeful it would lead to her name and the name of her killer. The forensic artist has the ability to, to develop a face that uh, gives that individual who's a victim of violent crime one last opportunity to be identified, and, and uh, that's the reason we, we do what we do. Hoping this would generate the lead they needed to link Ronald Holloway to the murder victim, Investigators quickly released the sketch through the media. Within a few hours, they got a tip. A caller recognized the sketch as resembling 28-year-old Jennifer D. Weiniger, who shared a house with her boyfriend in nearby Elmo, Texas. Police went to the address. Ray Dawson agreed that the sketch he had seen in the paper looked like his girlfriend. Police asked him for a photograph of Jennifer. The picture of the girl was a dead ringer of the, the uh, artist rendering that 
Karen had fixed for us. We've been together for the past two years. Around the time Jennifer disappeared, Dawson said he was in jail on traffic violations. And though he hadn't heard from her since, he didn't think much of it. In the past, Jennifer would ask him to drive her to the local bus station. She was a free spirit and enjoyed being out on the road. In fact, she would often take off on hitchhiking trips across the country and be gone for months at a time. Police specifically asked him about Jennifer's friends and associates. But Dawson didn't know anyone named Ronald Holloway. Believing they had finally identified their homicide victim, authorities retrieved Jennifer Weiniger's dental records and compared them to the remains found at the lake. It was a perfect match. Though Karen Taylor's facial reconstruction had led to a positive identification of the remains found at Willow Lake, investigators were no closer to proving Ronald Holloway was the killer. And under Texas law, police only had a few days left before they would have to release the suspect. Unless they could find a way to connect him directly to the victim, Holloway might just get away with murder. With the help of forensic artist Karen Taylor, authorities in Van Zandt County, Texas, had finally identified skeletal remains as 28-year-old murder victim Jennifer Weiniger. Though authorities had established a physical link between evidence found at the crime scenes and the home of Ronald Holloway, they struggled to tie the suspect directly to the victim. And they had only a few more days to prove he was the killer. Otherwise, they would be forced by Texas law to set him free. Hoping to uncover a connection between the suspect and the victim, police began canvassing Jennifer's Elmo, Texas neighborhood. A clerk at a local convenience store knew Jennifer well. She used to come into the store several times a week. And there was more. Captain Rock Ellis. About the time that she disappeared, he told me that Jennifer was at the store. Holloway pulled in, and he was pretty well known because he had at that time a pretty flashy red truck, and that he talked to her outside the store that evening about 10 o'clock, and that she got in the truck, and uh, they left together. I tried very hard to find anyone who had seen her after that night and couldn't. Under questioning, Ronald Holloway insisted he didn't know anyone named Jennifer Weiniger. Police knew that was a lie. Though all the evidence against him was circumstantial, investigators felt they had enough to finally win a murder conviction. Police believe that in August of 1988, the rage Holloway had asserted towards women in the past resurfaced soon after he and Jennifer began a relationship. Using a blunt object, he beat Jennifer Weininger to death and then disposed of her remains in Willow Lake. On January 30th, 1990, Ronald Mark Holloway was convicted of the murder of Jennifer D. Weininger. He received a sentence of 25 years to life in prison. When solving a murder, homicide investigators rely on the victim's identity to lead them to a suspect. But to give a faceless victim a name, police turn to forensic artists who can expose a killer's guilt by drawing conclusions. A southeastern Virginia community is stunned by a crime no one can believe. A pregnant woman murdered, her baby lost. Across the state, another town feels a similar shock, a brutal random slaying in a most unexpected setting. Two crimes no one could predict, with no eyewitnesses, few clues, and killers on the run. To solve the crimes, investigators must find the fatal twist.
In this program, some of the names have been changed. In Chesapeake, Virginia, on July 6, 2000, Raquel Foley came to the home of her neighbors, Martin and Melissa O'Connell. One of Melissa's co-workers had called Raquel and asked her to check on Melissa, who hadn't come into work that morning and wasn't answering her phone. Still on the line, the co-worker asked Raquel to check a back door. It was unlocked. Melissa's car was in the garage. In the kitchen, it looked like a dinner was prepared, but not eaten. Melissa was known for being on time every day and was eight months into a difficult pregnancy. The bedroom door was locked. Something was wrong. On the advice of the coworker, Raquel dialed 911 and reported her concerns to Chesapeake police. Chesapeake officers and EMTs responded immediately. Melissa had developed gestational diabetes during her pregnancy. If she had passed out in the bedroom, she could go into a diabetic coma, endangering herself and the baby. They had to get to her. Unlike the rest of the house, the bedroom was in disarray. Then they discovered a body face down in the bathtub. The expectant mother was dead. It was too late to save the baby. Melissa had bruises on her body and there was some blood on the tub. Officers radioed in the suspicious death. About that time, Melissa's husband, Martin O'Connell, pulled up to the house. He said Melissa's co-worker had called, saying something about an ambulance. An officer asked Martin to wait outside until detectives arrived to speak with him. Homicide detective Tom Downing was on duty that morning. I heard the call uh, coming out. Uh, on the uh, patrol channel that uh, the investigators were uh, requesting the uh, forensics people to respond, uh, as well as the detectives. On the route, the area. With Downing was his partner, Detective Mike Toothman. It is standard procedure for homicide detectives to respond to any suspicious death. Hey, Lieutenant, what we got? An officer briefed them on what they knew so far. A dead body, signs of possible ransacking in the bedroom, an unlocked back door, and the woman's husband just informed of the death. Martin O'Connell was uh, sitting up against the front of the house, uh, adjacent to the garage door, with his head down. He seemed to be uh, very distraught, and I asked him if he would, wouldn't mind coming into uh, the vehicle so Detective Toothman and myself can interview him. Martin told the detectives he had been trying to get in touch with Melissa that morning. He hadn't seen her since the night before. He had indicated he had no idea what had, what had happened to his wife. During the interview, we were able to clearly observe a number of abrasions, uh, as well as a bandaged finger. When we questioned him about that, he said that he and his wife had had a fight the previous night. Martin said that the night before, he and Melissa stop. began arguing. No, you want your manager At one point, back. he tried to quiet her by putting his hand up to her mouth. What are you, crazy? You know what? Get out! She was so Get angry, out. she no, bit him on the out. finger, hard. Still finding her he said she kicked him out of the house, so he went driving around nearby Virginia Beach. She bit me, put my hand up. He told Detective Toothman he tried to get back in touch with Melissa. He had called back to the house on his cell phone and left numerous messages on his uh, digital voice recorder. 
uh, during that time, he was saying things about uh, being lost in Virginia Beach. Um, Melissa, pick up the phone. I'm sorry we fought. According to Martin, after several hours, he came back home, hoping he and Melissa could work things out. But in the garage, he found some of his clothes with a note from Melissa telling him not to come back that night. He switched cars and left. Uh, I'm not really sure. Martin told the detectives that he checked into a local hotel. I had asked him at this point uh, about the abrasions on his arms and elbows and the hands. Martin explained that after checking into the hotel, he went to a local bar and had a few drinks. Okay, and I see that you've got some fresh He said outside the bar, he tripped and fell, cutting his arms. The detectives asked if they could document the injuries. Martin agreed, saying he would do anything to help. The detectives next talked with Raquel Foley, the neighbor who first entered the house, and Cheryl Ramsdell, Melissa's co-worker, to get more information about Melissa. What we learned about Melissa O'Connell during this investigation was that she was just a, a nice person. She uh, you know, did everything right. She was a loving, devoted wife. She couldn't wait to be a, a loving, devoted mother. Everybody that knew her uh, liked her, loved her. And uh, it, was, it was just a, a tragedy that, uh, that she was taken so early. The women believed Melissa and Martin had a strong relationship. They also um, said Melissa was very security conscious, almost paranoid, and always kept the house locked tight. No physical, OK? All right, thank you very Investigators much. hoped the crime scene would provide some answers. Before processing the scene, senior forensics technician Nick Pazillo videotaped everything. The master bedroom was in a complete, total state of disarray. Everything was trashed. Uh, the drawers were dumped out. The rest of the house looked absolutely immaculate, except for this one room. It looked more like a ransacking than signs of a struggle. There was a lack of blood in the area. We didn't notice blood anywhere. Uh, and at that point, we really didn't know what we had. From the toilet, the technicians recovered a partially smoked cigarette. Around the tub, they found several broken candlesticks and a pair of shorts. Also near the tub were the first signs of blood for forensics technician Grover Davis. The water was discolored in the bathtub, and there was a little bit of staining around the bathtub area and the floor area. They collected samples for later study at the crime lab. To the investigators, it looked like a murder. Now they had to find out who would have wanted Melissa O'Connell and her unborn child dead. Police in Chesapeake, Virginia, were investigating the death of Melissa O'Connell, eight months pregnant with her first child. Evidence gathered in the bathroom where the body was found indicated murder. We were thinking that there was a, a good possibility that she may have been placed in the bathtub. Um, after she was killed. The investigators continued checking the rest of the house. Everything seemed normal. They confiscated the answering machine in case it held any clues. I surveyed the entire perimeter of the house uh, from the outside and the inside, checking all points of entry, all doors and windows. Uh, found everything to be locked and secured. There was no sign of forced entry with the exception of uh, the back door, which was open. Investigators believed the ransacking was staged. If the person came in to burglarize the house, why didn't they go to other rooms of the house where there were more valuable items than there were in the, in the bedroom? I was very uh, concerned uh, after leaving the crime scene because things just were not were quickly not adding up. They needed more information. As promised, Martin O'Connell, the victim's husband, 
came to the police station that afternoon for another interview. Detectives were having a hard time eliminating him as a suspect. Family and friends had told police Melissa never allowed smoking in the house, so they believed the killer smoked the cigarette found in the toilet after the murder. We found that Martin O'Connell was uh, a smoker and that he did smoke that brand of cigarette. He again went over his actions on the night in question. The impression that I had was that he was very intent on giving us his alibi. But the detectives noticed that several times some small details of his story changed. They confronted him directly. The interview had started to turn into an interrogation. And at that point, uh, Martin basically shut down. He said he was tired, he wanted to go home. He agreed to meet with me the next morning and finish up the interview. And he also said that he would agree to a polygraph. What really concerned us was uh, the fact that he had never asked how his wife had, had died. He never asked anything about where she was found. Uh, he didn't uh, ask any questions about the baby. And uh, this was uh, very significant because, you know, normally so that would be the first thing that somebody would want to uh, know. You know, they would wanna, they'd want to know these things. Perhaps the autopsy would provide more clues. Dr. Leah Bush led the medical team. When I first examined Melissa's body, I was struck by the number of bruises and scratches over her body, which indicated significant blunt force trauma. This woman had been beaten up. It was definitely a murder. Defensive injuries indicated Melissa fought back. She fought for her life. She tried to protect herself and her unborn child from being strangled and beaten to death. They had to prove who killed the mother and unborn child. Detective Downing asked Dr. Bush about Martin O'Connell's bite mark. Martin said he was facing Melissa when he put his hand up to her face. In your opinion. That is far more consistent with somebody having their hand over a person's mouth, trying to muffle their screams or using it as a control mechanism, and then she bit the finger because that on the side because that was the part of the finger close to her such as this. And when she bit his finger, it wasn't a playful bite. A large piece of flesh was missing. This was somebody who was biting in an attempt to save their life. As each new fact emerged, Martin O'Connell looked more suspicious. But investigators had no solid evidence against him or anyone else. Homicide detectives Mike Toothman and Tom Downing still did not even know exactly where Melissa had been murdered. It had been made to look like a burglary, which we could tell it, it didn't make sense. It wasn't a burglary. Uh, we needed the forensics to tell us exactly what did happen. They secured a search warrant for biological samples. I called his attorney and I told him that I had a search warrant to obtain uh, Martin's DNA, his blood, and some hair samples. Uh, and uh, he, Martin, did meet me here at uh, headquarters, and we had the paramedics uh, draw the blood and, and pull the hair samples. The samples could be useful in later lab examinations. Investigators were trying to put together what really happened on the night Melissa died. Martin claimed Melissa bit his finger during an argument downstairs. Martin had told us that the actual fight, the confrontation that they had had the previous evening occurred in the living room. And I even had him show me exactly the spot where they were at the time. After his telling us that, of course, we had the living room moving old and processed and there was no evidence of any blood there. Evidence technician Grover Davis began another search of the house, trying to determine where Melissa was attacked. The second trip that we took to the house, we found minute pieces of what we thought were blood or particles of blood 
on the door and it led all the way down to the floorboard and the and the uh, the uh, rug of the uh, of the closet. Um, we didn't notice it at first because it was so minute and the closet itself didn't appear to be touched. It was a major discovery. We ended up sawing out some of the wallboard in the closet area, the, the floor area itself, a uh, piece of carpet from the floor, any area that we felt could contain any blood evidence or hair or slime, any bodily fluids. We sent those items to the forensic lab. Okay, good job. Police hoped the findings would point them to Melissa's killer. In July of 2000, Chesapeake, Virginia police worked to solve a heartbreaking murder, the beating and strangulation death of Melissa O'Connell, eight months pregnant with a baby girl. The prime suspect was Melissa's husband, Martin O'Connell, who had fresh injuries that he tried to explain away to police. His story seemed unlikely, and police hoped to disprove it with forensic science. At the Eastern Laboratory of the Virginia Division of Forensic Science, DNA examiner B.J. Blankenship compared the DNA from the bloodstain evidence collected at the house to the known DNA profiles of Melissa and Martin O'Connell. On the carpet, the original blood sample that I found uh, matched Melissa's blood. I then went back later and found several other uh, lighter blood stains that one of them matched Martin, and three others were a mixture of blood between Martin and Melissa. When they're mixed together, that means that they were present together at the time the blood was shed. Then the examiner made another important discovery. So I was examining the carpet from the closet and as I looked down, I noticed something beside the blood stain that was red. So I picked it up with my forceps and looked under the microscope to see what it was. And lo and behold, it was a piece of skin. And you could even see the ridge detail on the skin. The ridge detail meant the skin came from the bottom of a foot, a palm, or a finger. I immediately called the, the police department to ask them if the defendant had any wounds, and he did, in fact, have a wound on his finger. To Dr. Blankenship, it was clear that Martin O'Connell was lying to police and that he was there when his wife was killed. Martin O'Connell told the police the story that the struggle occurred with his wife downstairs. The forensics told us a different story. It said that it happened upstairs in the closet. That's where the original fight occurred. Investigators kept looking for more circumstantial evidence. Melissa's friends had said the couple seemed happy, excited about the baby. But when detectives spoke to Martin's friends, they got a different story. What we had learned is that uh, he really was not planning on being a family man. I mean, that was the far furthest thing from his lifestyle. Detectives also heard unsettling news. Martin had left town. Several friends believed he was now living with relatives in Florida. Martin left the state without submitting to the polygraph examination he promised detectives he would take. Because he had not been charged, leaving was not a crime. But it was certainly suspicious. The Chesapeake detectives contacted police in West Palm Beach, Florida, who agreed to set up surveillance at the condo of one of Martin's relatives. Soon, they spotted the suspect. While West Palm Beach could not maintain 24-hour surveillance, they would do regular checks to try to keep an eye on him. In Virginia, detectives were still hoping to figure out the motive for the murder. Then, detectives received a call from a woman in San Diego, California, 
who said she had an affair with Martin while he was working in the area for a few months that year. When she learned of Melissa's death, she told them she was compelled to call. Based on that information, myself and Detective Toothman went out. We flew out to San Diego and interviewed a young lady. We had learned a lot about Martin. Um, he was at, actually in San Diego for an extended period of time, and he had met her. But he never told this young lady that, that he was married, and certainly nothing about a, a, a child on the way, a close relationship. He told the young woman he wanted her to move to Florida so they could be together. So at that point, uh, I think that we realized that we had the motive. And please um, give me a call if anything comes to mind. It was time to bring in Martin O'Connell, if they could find him. After several weeks, Chesapeake police were ready to arrest Martin O'Connell for the murder of his pregnant wife. But the suspect had fled to Florida. He had been spotted at a relative's condo in West Palm Beach, but then disappeared. A West Palm Beach deputy tried a ruse to find him. He spoke to the relative about a property damage report Martin had filed with the condo association, saying he needed to talk to Martin about it. The relative said she did not know where Martin was, but would try to have him call. The next day, the deputy received a message from Martin O'Connell with a phone number. He called the number and told Martin he needed his signature on a form about the damage claim. Martin asked him to fax it, but the deputy insisted he needed the original signed. He had to have an address. Reluctantly, Martin gave him the address in Clearwater, Florida. The deputy immediately called the Chesapeake detectives and gave them the address. Okay, thank you very much. They, in turn, called police in Clearwater and told them about the case and their arrest warrant. Clearwater PD agreed to attempt the arrest. That's him. Officers set up surveillance at the Clearwater address. It wasn't long before Martin O'Connell showed up and was safely taken into custody and extradited back to Virginia. Prosecutors and detectives worked together to bring this emotional case to trial. In June 2002, a jury agreed on what happened the night of Melissa O'Connell's death. Just weeks before the baby was due, the couple had an argument. In Melissa's walk-in closet, Martin attacked. When he tried to stifle her screams, she bit him, fighting for her life. But he was too strong. Martin O'Connell was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At the time, Virginia law made it impossible to charge him with killing his unborn daughter, too. But because of this case, that has changed. The city of Chesapeake was shaken to the core by the brutal crime. Three hundred miles to the west, another Virginia town was in for a similar shock. On the afternoon of October 11th, 1990, Roanoke police officers Michael Warner and Tom Kincaid were preparing for their shift when a man pulled up in a rush. Yes, sir. He exited the car and he was very nervous and he told us that uh, there had been a woman that had been killed in a, a basement at uh, Subdivision just up the street. Uh, at that time, we kind of wondered if it was for real. We asked him, or was he kidding us or, or joking with us? It was no joke. The officers asked where the house was. And he said that he could take us there if we'd follow him. So we went ahead and followed him up to the house.
the officers called in the report of a possible dead body. At the house, two women were waiting. They said they were local realtors. The woman inside was a co-worker. She was in the basement, dead. The officers had to clear the house to make sure no one dangerous was inside. In the kitchen, they found a realtor's notebook and business card. They headed to the basement. In a large pool of blood lay a body. Uh, we were pretty confident looking at the victim that she was deceased and there was no uh, immediate first aid that we could give her. The officers called for detectives and crime scene technicians. Outside, the okay. other realtors said the dead woman was named Carolyn Rogers. We're not aware of. I don't think so. But after this point, she was the co-workers had come to the house looking for Carolyn when she didn't show up for lunch and found the body. None of them had seen anyone leaving the house. Roanoke County Police forensic evidence technicians soon arrived. It was up to them and the medical examiner to find the clues left behind and determine what happened inside the house. Also responding were county detectives. They would try to use those clues to find whoever was responsible. The patrol officers briefed the others on the apparent homicide. What we have inside is down in the basement, we have a white female gentleman here is found behind me. I've interviewed him. Got his Detective statement. Phil Patron knew the evidence search was critical. Um, that's kind of where we're at right now. We had no eyewitnesses that we were able to determine immediately. We had just the victim in the basement. Forensic evidence technician Rick Moorer helped process the basement. We carefully went through the scene. We began to photograph it using a 35 millimeter camera. And uh, documenting it through sketches and so forth. Medical examiner William Masello checked the body. This was uh, a middle-aged woman that was uh, lying face down, and there was a, a large pool of blood around her. Very obviously, she had uh, sustained some sort of an injury which had resulted in bleeding, be it a gunshot wound, stab wound at all. I didn't really know what it was until I got into uh, further examining the body. Body temperature indicated the woman had been dead for several hours. Here. The most obvious clues were the bloody shoe prints. Preserving them was crucial for forensic scientist supervisor Michael Grimm. At the scene, we took photographs of footwear impressions. And included in the photographs were scales to assure proper enlargement of the impressions once they were returned to the lab. A number of the impressions appeared to have been made by a female shoe based on the shape and size. In addition to that, there were footwear impressions that appeared to have been made by a much larger shoe, one with a large heel and a large sole area. The technician searched for any other clues. I discovered a, a small button that was laying in the blood. Uh, I felt that that was very important. That button did not match any of the buttons that Mrs. Rogers had on. So uh, we were very careful to collect that. The evidence suggested to police that this was definitely a murder. Investigators then looked to determine their first lead. There were no vehicles at the house. She was a realtor, and if she had to get there somehow, it... so we assumed then at least that the car was stolen. When police contacted Carolyn's family, they learned details about her car and put out an all-points bulletin for it. 
Lieutenant Warner was part of the force out looking for the car. I started concentrating my efforts on large parking lots, motel rooms, and stuff like that in the area. And approximately 9, 30, 10 o'clock that evening, I was at the mall, and I happened to spot the vehicle. Uh, once I did, I laid back and watched it just for a few minutes. I noticed that there was nobody hanging around it. Dispatch, I'm going to be out on John Lincoln Charles 7865. Warner called in the discovery and did a cursory check of the vehicle. The door was locked. But inside, he could see a legal pad. looked like it had blood spots on it. If so, it could help lead to the killers. Investigators sent the pad to the crime lab for immediate analysis. Roanoke Police Chief Ray Lavender looked for other clues. We immediately notified security at uh, the mall uh, where the car was located that uh, if any other evidence or suspicious activity occurred in the area, we would like to know about it immediately. Any articles of clothing uh, that might indicate a person had changed clothing, anything at all like that. Next morning, they got a call back. Some of the maintenance personnel at the mall had located a pair of shoes and had thrown those shoes into a dumpster. We immediately went to that dumpster. We located the shoes. They had uh, small heels uh, similar to the type of shoes that may have walked through the blood at the crime scene. We labeled them uh, and uh, tagged them and immediately took them uh, as evidence and later submitted them to the lab. The investigators tried to work quickly Whoever committed such a senseless and vicious crime had to be stopped fast. Roanoke, Virginia police believed two people were involved in the brutal slaying of realtor Carolyn Rogers. Technicians found two sets of bloody shoe prints at the scene and collected a legal pad with possible blood stains from the victim's car. Yet investigators had no idea who the suspects were or where they went. They hoped more information would turn up at the autopsy. Assistant Chief Medical Examiner William Masello led the post-mortem examination. Cause of death in this uh, individual was a stab wound to the chest going right, right through the heart and the left lung. At the edge of the fatal wound, the doctor noted scalloped markings. And uh, these were very suggestive of a uh, stake-type knife or a knife with a serrated blade. The doctor also discovered a distinctive pattern of bruises on the back of the head. period blunt impacts. So this is the type of the thing you might see when some sort of an object uh, strikes the head. The wounds were photographed for comparison in case a weapon was found. The victim's family had said she always wore nice jewelry, yet none remained on the body. Bruises indicated someone had forcibly removed her ring and earrings. Got this from the bank. Though still shocked and grieving, Carolyn's husband did what he could to help. Are those the three checks here at the bottom? He had reviewed the couple's Marcia bank accounts Smith. and discovered a check cashed the, the day of the murder. Marcia J. Smith. Five hundred dollars for house cleaning services. We don't have a house cleaning service detective. He told Detective Phil Patrone it was a forgery. Our checks. Made out to a person that Mr. Rogers didn't know. In fact, Mr. Rogers made it very clear to us that they didn't have a house cleaning service. A detective went to the bank and spoke to the manager there. The manager had saved the canceled check, made out to a Marsha J. Smith. At the Virginia Division of Forensic Science, examiners did the processing. 
To develop any unseen fingerprints, the forged check was sprayed with ninhydrin aerosol. Ninhydrin reacts to secretions from human skin that transfer easily to porous surfaces. The legal pad found in the victim's car was also processed. Forensic scientist Michael Grimm introduced heat and steam from a household iron to cause the reaction. Several partial fingerprints were revealed. He then turned to the legal pad. During that examination, a fingerprint was developed in the lower right-hand corner on the front page of the notepad. This fingerprint was photographed and subsequently entered into Virginia's automated fingerprint identification system, also known as APHIS. Within a matter of minutes, a potential hit was returned uh, to the laboratory. It was for a woman named Wendy Horst. Detective Patron called in the hit. An address was found for Marcia Smith, whose name appeared on the forged check. Detectives traveled to Blacksburg, Virginia, to interview her. Wendy Horst. Do you know anything about Marcia did know Wendy Horst. She used to work with her. And Marcia had recently lost her license. My driver's license. It was all around the same time Horst left town. Detectives believed Horst stole the license, then used it to cash the forged check. Thank you. Detective Kern soon received a background check on Wendy Horst. She was the girlfriend of a known violent offender named Danny King. Danny was pretty much a career criminal. He had been involved in a number of crimes, a number of violent crimes. He had just gotten out of uh, prison. He'd been out of prison 10 days when this offense occurred. Danny was uh, just absolutely uh, a ruthless uh, criminal. Roanoke police went to King's last known address and yeah. spoke with a relative Hi, there. Yes, I am. She was a very cooperative person. She was very uh, sorry for the uh, reasons that we were there. The woman yes, said Wendy uh, Horst had lived with her yes. until Danny got out of prison recently. You saw him. What were they doing? She had observed a license plate taken off the female accomplice's vehicle, put onto a van that uh, Danny and his accomplice had just driven in with one day. Uh, on the 11th. The and day the after, after the Rogers murder, the couple left town. And they were in a rush to leave. Investigators did not know where the pair had gone, but now they had a license plate number. They entered the plate, as well as descriptions of the van and the two suspects, into the National Crime Information Center's computer system and put out a nationwide teletype requesting law enforcement agencies across the country to look out for the couple. The chances were slim. The couple could be anywhere. Then, on October 15th, just four days after the murder, a state trooper on patrol in New Philadelphia, Ohio, spotted a van at a rest area. November Charlie, 7406, on a gold. He called in the plates and learned the van was possibly connected to a murder in Virginia. 518, if you send me a 10 The trooper called for backup. Two brutal killers might be inside. Four days after realtor Carolyn Rogers was murdered in Roanoke, Virginia, police 350 miles northwest in New Philadelphia, Ohio, spotted the van associated with the two suspects. As soon as other state troopers arrived as backup, they moved in. Pass, stick your hands out the window. 
Driver, get your hands out the window. Hands out the window. In the passenger seat was Wendy Horst. Come out of the car nice and easy and face forward. The driver was Danny King. The two were taken into custody without a struggle. She ain't got nothing to do with this. She ain't got nothing to do with this. In their preliminary search of the van, Ohio troopers noticed a key ring with the logo of the victim's real estate company. They also spotted a knife, a knife. with a serrated blade. Okay. Ohio call. authorities contacted Roanoke Police Chief Ray Lavender. I had uh, received word from the Ohio Highway Patrol that they had located uh, uh, Danny King and his accomplice. I got the first flight out of Roanoke, which was about 4 a.m. the next morning. After getting a warrant, the Roanoke police conducted a full search of the suspect's van. They found some clothing, both male and female, that appeared to have blood on it. One piece caught their attention. We also located a work shirt uh, with a missing button. And the reason that was important to us is that we had found a button at the crime scene. And the buttons on that shirt were identical to those we found at the crime scene. Uh, we also recovered a pair of boots that we believed belonged to Mr. King. We were particularly interested in those. Their soles would be compared to the bloody crime scene shoe prints. The tread pattern looks very familiar. Investigators also collected the knife Ohio troopers had spotted. After collecting the evidence, the detectives went to interview Wendy Horst. She admitted to forging the check and pawning the ring. She said that she was present at the house at the time of the murder, but swore she did not see it actually happen. She said that she really didn't know what happened, uh, that uh, Mr. King was in the basement with a real estate agent, and he came out of the basement, ordered her to get in the car and drive uh, to the local mall. As the interview continued in Ohio, examiners in Virginia processed two more forged checks that had been recovered. Prints were lifted from the new checks and compared to King's known prints. Those fingerprints were positively identified as fingerprints of Danny King. That's it, that's it, that's a match. It was time to interview King. No, 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 King denied no, having no, anything to do with the murder. No, didn't find my there would be no check. confession. Well, I'm just to prove you, what happened, investigators me. turned to forensic evidence. So maybe they're wrong. Michael Grimm checked the shoe prints photographed at the scene against the recovered shoes. The examiner reported a strong association between the high heels and the smaller crime scene prints. And a positive match between the boots and the larger prints. Next, he checked the reproductions and inked impressions of the suspect's feet against the wear on the inside of the shoes. He reported similar findings. Horst could not be eliminated as the primary wearer of the heels, and Danny King was an exact match with the boots. It is our opinion that these characteristics are unique to that shoe. The lab findings were exactly what Commonwealth's attorney Randy Leach needed for trial. It would have been a very difficult case to prosecute without the forensic evidence. In June 1991, the prosecutor used the forensic evidence to prove to a jury what happened to Carolyn Rogers. She can't meet us at like 10 in the morning. Okay. Cool. Okay. But don't use your name. Danny King had his girlfriend call some realtors, allegedly to look at a house. See if she can meet us earliest time. 
Carolyn Rogers had the misfortune to take the call. Get one of your houses on Jefferson Street? Yes, the morning would be best. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Cool. So you meet us? Let's go. Sharon Semple, the motive behind the crime was robbery. Danny King had been in the penitentiary for a number of years and had been out for 10 days. He had no income, and the crime was committed to get Carolyn Rogers jewelry, her checkbook, any cash she might have had, so they would have money to go out of state on a honeymoon trip. When they got to the basement, King's girlfriend decided to go outside for a cigarette. Yeah. I'm gonna go have a cigarette. Leaving Danny uh, King alone with Carolyn. Danny King was a dangerous man. He didn't care who he had to hurt to get what he wanted. He killed her and robbed her. They parked the victim's car at a local mall where Danny wiped it down to get rid of any fingerprints. He made his girlfriend leave her shoes. He thought he had erased any trace of their passage, any connection between them and the murder. But the Roanoke investigators and lab examiners found all the evidence they needed. Fingerprints, shoe prints, even a shirt button. We were able to show the jury that not only had he stabbed her, and not only did she die a horrible death there, but that she had been stomped in the head with his boot. That went a long way toward convicting Danny King and, and the ultimate punishment being imposed. The jury found Danny King guilty of forgery, robbery, and murder and recommended the death penalty. He was executed on July 23rd, 1998. His accomplice was convicted of accessory after the fact and received five years. She has since been released. Many homicide victims place themselves in dangerous situations. When the purely innocent are taken, Police and forensic examiners work especially hard to find answers in the fatal twist.